Today we're going to talk about population ecology and the distribution of organisms. So before we even begin, make sure you've read the assigned chapters in your textbook. You've made notes on that, not just highlighted, but made notes, and created an outline from the information that you can view on the slides in the PDF for, for this particular lecture. During the lecture, minimize all distractions, turn off music, listen to a quiet space, and turn off your phone. Take plenty of notes for this lecture, and then be sure that you're putting the slides in your own words. This will help maximize your learning. So let's turn off the phones and get started. Here's the concept map for the lecture. We'll be introducing the field of ecology, considering levels of ecological study, and then focusing on one of those levels, population ecology. We will go through population growth modeling, covering both exponential and logistics growth, and we will end up on the topic of life history biology. So what is ecology? It is a scientific study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. These interactions determine the distribution of organisms and their abundance. That part of ecology, ecology, the distribution and abundance bit, it's considered population ecology. Ecological research involves both observational and experimental study. Just like molecular biologists, ecologists observe nature, generate hypotheses, manipulate environmental variables, and observe outcomes. If an ecologist discovered a new frog species, she might ask, what environmental factors limit the geographic distribution of this species? How do interactions with other species affect population size? Are patterns of skin coloration used in mate selection? Ecologists study interactions between organisms and between organisms in their environment at different scales from that of the individual organism to the scale of the entire planet. This scale is shown here from big on top to smaller on the bottom scale. In the next few slides, we will describe the differences in these scales, which will be important for understanding the rest of this lecture. We'll start at the small end of the scale and describe the various scales of ecological study. Organismal ecology considers how an organism's structure, physiology, and behavior meet environmental challenges. The subfield of ecology that typically focuses on the organism are physiological, evolutionary, and behavioral ecology. Population ecology, the main focus of today's lecture, considers factors affecting population size over time. A population is a group of individuals of the same species living in a defined area. Community ecology considers all the interacting species within a community and a community is defined as a group of populations of different species in a given area. We continue to move further up the ecological scale and we reach ecosystem ecology which emphasizes energy flow and chemical cycling among various biotic, living, and abiotic, non-living, components of the environment. The definition of an ecosystem is a community of organisms in an area and the physical factors with which they interact. Landscape ecology is often considered to be a larger scale than ecosystem ecology and landscape ecologists focus on the exchange of energy, materials, and organisms across multiple ecosystems. A landscape or seascape, if we're thinking about marine ecology, is a mosaic of connected ecosystems. Finally, the larger scale of ecological study is global ecology, which is concerned with the biosphere which is the global ecosystem, the sum of all the planet's ecosystems. Ecologists distinguish between and seek to understand the relationship among and between biotic and abiotic factors. Abiotic factors are the non-living chemical and physical attributes of the environment, such as 
climate variables like precipitation or temperature or geochemical variables like soil, substrate, nutrients, pH, or salt content. Biotic factors are related to other organisms that make up the living components of the environment. Biotic factors include food resources, competitors, mutualism, enemies, predators, parasites, the photos on the slide help illustrate these abiotic and biotic factors. On the left, you see some dramatic weather, which is a non-living component of the environment. In the center is a bee visiting a flowering plant, gaining nutrients from the plant and providing pollination. The right photo illustrates predation. You see an owl that has recently caught a mouse. Herbivory is the term of predation when a predator is a herbivore an organism that eats plants or algae. So far, we've introduced ecology and provided context for the various subfields within the discipline. Now we will explore population ecology in more depth. Population ecology explores how biotic and abiotic factors influence the density, distribution, and size of populations. Remember that we define a population as a group of individuals of a single species living in the same general area. The researcher typically defines the boundaries of a population. However, the goal is that this is grounded in biological reality. For example, it is quite simple to consider the entire population of a particular terrestrial bird species on a small island. Sometimes the boundaries of a population are arbitrarily drawn, like a study of oak trees in a county in Georgia. The density of a population is the number of individuals per unit area or volume. For example, we might count the number of oak trees per square kilometer or the number of E. coli bacteria per milliliter in a test tube. Dispersion is the pattern of spacing among the individuals within the boundaries of the population. It is unusual to get an accurate count of all the individuals in a population, so researchers often use sampling techniques to estimate densities and total population sizes. For example, counting the number of bird nests in a given area, an ecologist can extrapolate to arrive at an estimate for the number of individual birds in a given area. What affects population density? Population density is the result of an interplay between processes that add individuals to a population and that remove individuals. Additions can occur through birth and immigration which is the influx of new individuals from other areas. Removal of individuals occurs through death or immigration, which is the movement of individuals out of a population. This figure illustrates the influx and removal of individuals from a population. Patterns of dispersion, the spacing of individuals within a population, are influenced by environmental and social factors. The most common pattern of dispersion is clumped, where individuals aggregate in patches. Clumped dispersion may be influenced by resource availability and behavior. A uniform dispersion is one in which individuals are evenly distributed. For example, in plants, uniform dispersion may occur as a result of the secretion of chemicals that inhibit the growth or germination of nearby individuals. So even if seeds are distributed randomly or in a clumped fashion, a uniform pattern of dispersion emerges. In animals, uniform dispersion may be influenced by social interactions such as the territorial behavior where individuals defend an area against intrusion by other individuals. In random dispersion, the position of each individual is independent of other individuals. That means there may be clumped sections or some areas that appear uniform, but there is no overall pattern. Random dispersion occurs 
in the absence of strong attractions or repulsions among individuals and tends to occur in areas where key physical or chemical factors are relatively constant across the study area. Next, we will consider how to model population growth. Ecologists use mathematical models to understand and to predict how populations grow. Populations of all species have the potential to expand rapidly, and unlimited growth does not occur under ideal conditions. However, in nature, population growth is typically limited by a number of factors. Ecologists study population growth both in idealized and realistic conditions as we will do today in this lecture. We will start with the verbal equation for the factors that cause changes in population. The change in population size is equal to the number of births plus the number of immigrations entering the population minus the number of deaths minus the number of immigrants leaving the population. From here on, we will ignore immigration and emigration and only think about population size as a function of births minus deaths. We can use math to express this simplified relationship more concisely. If n represents population size and t represents time, then delta n is the change in population size and delta t is the time interval over which we are evaluating population growth. We can rewrite this equation from the last side to reflect the one on this slide. Typically, ecologists are most interested in change in population size, the number of individuals added to or subtracted from the population. We call that R where R is simply the difference between the number of births and the number of deaths. So our revised formula reads delta N divided by delta T equals R. Next, we can convert our equation or our model into one in which changes in population size are expressed on a per individual or per capita basis. The per capita change in population size R delta T represents the contribution that an average member of the population makes to the population size during the time interval delta T. For example, for a population of 1,000 individuals that increases by 16 individuals per year, the per capita change in population size is 16 divided by 1,000, which is 0.016. On average, each individual has 0.016 offspring, if we're ignoring immigration, per year. Although that seems silly since it's only a fraction of an offspring per year, hopefully you can see the utility of this kind of approach. We can use the R delta T N to calculate how many individuals will be added to a population every year. Let's put these parts together to revise our model for population growth, which we can now write as delta N divided by delta T equals R delta T times N. Remember that up until now, our equation is for a specific time interval, often one year. However, many ecologists prefer to use different calculus to express population growth as a rate of change at each instant in time. We can convert our previous equation into a different equation, dn divided by dt equals rn. You do not need to have taken calculus to unpack this formula. DN divided by DT represents very small changes in population size. DN over very short, instantaneous, really, time intervals, DT. This is the formula or model for exponential population growth, and it is highly important that you understand the formula that is on this slide. 
Here's the formula again. R in this formula is the intrinsic rate of increase. This is defined as the per capita rate at which the population increases its size at each instant in time. So similar to R sub delta T, but now our time interval is very, very, very small. N is the initial or current population size. Exponential growth occurs under idealized condition. So when food is abundant and all individuals repro reproduce at their physiological capacity. Under such conditions, the population increases in size by a constant proportion at each instant in time. This graph shows the population size, n, on the y-axis, the number of generations, so time, on the x-axis. The curves plot population growth through time. What is the difference between these two curves? Let's take a look at the formulas listed next to them. You may have spotted that the two populations have different intrinsic rates that increase, the different R's. One, the blue curve, has an R of 1.0, while the red curve has an R of 0.5. Both appear to have started at the same number of initial individuals, big N. The higher the intrinsic rate of increase, the R, the faster the population grows. Exponential growth, which is characterized by the J-shaped curve you just saw, can be found in populations in new environments or populations experiencing a rebound. For example, the elephant population in Kruger National Park in South Africa grew exponentially after hunting elephants was banned. You can see these data plotted on the graph below. The exponential growth model assumes that resources remain abundant even as the population grows. This is rarely the case in the real world. So exponential growth, while it does occur, can rarely be sustained for long. A more realistic population growth model limits growth by incorporating a carrying capacity. The carrying capacity, denoted by the capital letter K, is the maximum population size the environment can support. The carrying capacity varies over space and time depending on limited resources, food, shelter, refugee from predators, water, etc. We typically think about a carrying capacity for a particular species or population in a particular place. Carrying capacities can be very challenging to estimate, but they are useful for thinking about how populations grow in a world with limited resources. As a population grows in size and approaches the carrying capacity, the per capita birth rate decreases and or the per capita death rate increases. These changes in rates cause the per capita growth rate to become lower. When we impose a carrying capacity, as is the case with the logistic population growth model, the per capita rate of increase approaches zero as the carrying capacity is reached. The logistic model starts out with the exponential model and adds the expression that reduces the per capita rate of increases as n approaches k. So dn over dt equals rn times k minus n divided by k. When you think of this expression of k minus n divided by k as a control knob for the per capita growth rate, r, when n is much lower than k, so when the population size is much smaller than the carrying capacity, this expression reduces to a large fraction. When you multiply r by a large fraction, like 1 close to 1, then the exponential growth rate, rn, isn't altered or slowed down that much. When the n is close to k, so when the population size is nearly at the carrying capacity, this results in a small fraction, and this strongly affects the calculation of rn. As you think this through, try to ground your thinking in the difference between n and k. Are we at a population size n? 
that is close or far away from the carrying capacity. And what does that mean for how this expression, k minus n over k, exerts control over Rn? Here is a graph showing both types of population growth models, as we discussed, side by side. The population size, n, is on the y-axis, and time, expressed as the number of generations, is on the x-axis. In both situations, the intrinsic rate of increase, r, is 1.0. But you can clearly see that the growth curves diverge rather quickly from the identical starting points. This is because as the red logistic curve approaches the carrying capacity of 1,500 individuals, the population growth begins to slow down. So our last topic for this lecture is life history, which is related to the population dynamics we just described. Population dynamics are influenced strongly by an organism's life history. Life history comprises the traits that affect an organism's schedule of reproduction and survival. For example, life history traits include the age at which reproduction begins, how often the organism reproduces, and how many offspring are produced per reproductive episode. Organisms have finite or limited resources, which can lead to trade-offs between survival and reproduction. Selective pressures also influence trade-offs between the number and size of offspring. Plants and animals whose young are more likely to die often produce many small offspring. For example, the dandelion produces many small seeds, few of which may reach a suitable habitat. In other organisms, extra investment on the part of the parent greatly increases the offspring's chance of survival. Brazilian tree nuts, shown here, produce large seeds packaged with nutrients to help the seedlings become established. Primates generally have only one or two offspring at a time and invest a lot of time caring into those offspring for extended periods of time. Ecologists have attempted to connect differences in these life history traits to the logistic growth model, as we just discussed. We can think about these connections by thinking about the traits favored at different population densities. Selections for traits that are sensitive to population density and are favored at high densities is known as K-selection or density-dependent selection. In contrast, selection for traits that maximize reproductive success in uncrowded environments, low density, is called R-selection or density independent selection. So K selection is said to operate in populations living at a density near their carrying capacity. Mature, mature trees in a forest is one example. While R selection is said to maximize the intrinsic rate of increase and occurs in environments in which population densities are well below the carrying capacity. We can extend this logic to different organisms who exhibit different life history strategies. An example of organisms that display K-selected life history traits is an elephant. They live a long time, they delay reproduction, and they produce few offspring that require a lot of care. On the other end of this life history axis, we have a rabbit, which displays our selected life history traits. Rabbits are short-lived, they produce, reproduce early in life, and they are multiple reproductive bouts each year for the rabbit. They produce many offspring per reproductive bout. Additionally, they do not provide a lot of parental care to those offspring. So let's use this video as a way to review the material that we've covered in this lecture. Very few organisms live solitary lives. Most interact with others of their own species, as well as with those of different species. They are also influenced by the characteristics of their environment. The study of how organisms relate to each other and to their environment is called ecology. The dynamics of populations, how fast a population grows, how large it becomes, what affects its growth, is an area of study called population ecology.
Rabbits have always been the symbol for prolific mating. With good reason, their populations can grow quickly. On average, a female rabbit can have six to ten babies, or kits, in each litter. The mating season extends over a six-month period, and a rabbit can have four or more litters per mating season. So with these impressive numbers, why isn't the earth covered in rabbits? A population of two rabbits increases as they mate and produce a litter. If adult rabbits successfully breed and no individual rabbits die, this population can increase fourfold each generation. This population explosion is referred to as exponential growth. If a population has no restrictions on growth, such as unlimited food sources or ample habitat, its size can increase exponentially. Let's look at the exponential growth of this population mathematically, starting with one mating pair. The exponential curve follows the equation g equals r times n, where the number of offspring, g, will be equal to the rate of growth, r, which in this case is three rabbits per adult, times the initial population size, n, or two. So in this example, g is six, because the rate of growth is three rabbits per adult, and there were two rabbits in the initial population. After each generation, the new rabbits are added to the existing population, such that n in generation 2 equals g plus n from generation 1, or 6 plus 2, which is 8. The population follows an exponential curve that increases in slope each generation. Obviously, this cannot continue forever because other factors affect the growth rate of the population. Let's go back to the beginning and see what happens in nature. The rate of growth can also be calculated as the birth rate, B, minus the death rate, D. Let's assume that the average litter of rabbits per mating pair produces eight babies. Out of those eight, two do not survive to adulthood. The rate of growth per the original number of rabbits was eight minus two divided by two, or three babies per adult. Factors other than mating success can also affect population size, g. Carrying capacity, k, is a limiting factor in population growth, as it represents the upper boundary of a population size in a particular environment because of limited resources. As the population begins to grow, resources are not yet scarce, and the population appears to grow exponentially because n is less than k. As the population size approaches the carrying capacity, in this case 20 rabbits, fewer offspring survive to adulthood, and the rate of growth, r, decreases as n approaches k. This is called logistic growth and is represented by a log curve on a graph. Eventually, the population will stabilize at the carrying capacity of the environment when n equals k and r is zero. Carrying capacity is an example of a density-dependent limit on growth. A density-dependent factor is a condition whose influence depends on the size of a population. It can be biotic factors, such as predation or sources of food, or abiotic, such as water supplies or habitat size. As a population approaches the carrying capacity, either the birth rate decreases or the death rate increases or both occur. Density-dependent factors include predation. When the size of the rabbit population increases, there is more prey available for predators to find, and therefore they kill relatively more rabbits reducing the rabbit population. Competition for food is also a density-dependent factor that limits population growth to the carrying capacity. As the rabbit population increases, there is less foliage available for all individuals. As a result, the mothers aren't as well-fed and they produce smaller litters and more rabbits starve to death. This decreases population size by reducing the birth rate and increasing the number of deaths. Disease or parasitic infections are also density-dependent factors. 
When the population is larger, there is crowding, and disease agents can pass more easily from one rabbit to the next, leading to reduced survival rates. Some factors that impact population growth are considered density independent. Regardless of the size or stability of the population, density independent factors will affect the growth of the population. Density independent factors can include flooding, extreme temperature changes, spreading of pesticides or herbicides, or a meteor hitting this island. Surviving individuals of a density independent event will carry the only alleles in the gene pool to repopulate the island. This results in lower genetic variability in the population that develops from these few remaining organisms. As we have seen, the growth of a population is dependent on many factors. To truly understand what challenges a population faces, you must look at both biotic factors, such as interactions with organisms and food availability, and abiotic factors, like weather and environmental conditions. Both affect how fast and how large a population will be able to grow. So today's lecture covered population ecology. We looked at density and dispersion of populations. We looked at modeling population growth, including carrying capacity, exponential population growth, as well as logistic population growth, and life history. If you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to your learning assistant or professor. As you finish the notes for this given lecture, combine those with the assigned reading notes that you've taken. As you go through your notes and look through the material, prepare for the quiz and the test by using your assisted reading questions as well as the questions at the end of the chapter and questions at the end of each chapter section.